Hey, everybody. Merry Christmas and happy holidays. We're taking this week off and hope you are, too, and taking some time to spend with your family and friends. This week, we bring you a holiday replay of one of our favorite episodes from the past, our interview with writer and director of the movie The Pollinators, Peter Nelson. This episode was originally released in March of 2019, and its message about protecting all pollinators, and especially honeybees, is as important now as it was then. It is wonderfully photographed by Peter, who is also a beekeeper, and features many beekeepers you may recognize as being one of our guests. Check out The Pollinators on your streaming service of choice this holiday season. Now, on to the show. Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast, presented by Bee Culture. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flatham. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta and in Butte, Montana or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Thanks, Sherry, and thank you, Global Patties. You know, each week we get to talk about how much we appreciate our sponsor support, and we know you'd rather we get right to talking about beekeeping. However, our great sponsors are critical to help making all of this happen. From the transcripts, the hosting fees, the software, the hardware, the microphones, the subscriptions, the recorders, they enable each episode. So with that, thanks to Bee Culture Magazine for continuing their presenting sponsorship of this podcast. Bee Culture has been the magazine for American beekeeping since 1873. Subscribe to Bee Culture today. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We're really happy you're here. Before we get started, just a quick reminder to subscribe or follow Beekeeping Today podcast and give us a five-star rating. It really does help. Also, we are now adding complete transcripts of each episode on the website after the show notes. Check them out. You can also leave questions and comments online under each show. You can leave a comment, ask a question, reply to a question, ours or our listeners. Click on leave a comment at the top of the episode's show notes to join the discussion. Have you listened to an episode and thought, that person sounds really interesting? and I'd like to know more about them. Well, now you can. Each episode links to a guest profile. Each profile has a guest photo, bio, contact information, including Instagram and Twitter details if they have them. Check it out. And finally, share the podcast with your beekeeping friends, email them links, or mention it at your next beekeeper meeting. Hey, beekeepers. Many times during the year, honeybees encounter scarcity of floral sources. As good beekeepers, we feed our bees artificial diets of protein and carbohydrates to keep them going during those stressful times. What is missing, though, are key components. The good microbes necessary for a bee to digest the food and convert it into metabolic energy. Only Super DFM Honeybee by strong microbials can provide the necessary microbes to optimally convert the artificial diet into energy necessary for improving longevity, reproduction, immunity, and much more. Super DFM Honeybee is an all-natural probiotic supplement for your honeybees. Find it at strongmicrobials.com or at fine bee supply stores everywhere. Beekeepers are kind of like the last of the cowboys you've seen in the westerns. We migrate the bees from up in the northern prairies all down here to the Bakersfield area and we keep them in the west side of the valley. When the spring bloom comes, we'll take the bees and we'll spread them from the Turlock area down to the southern Bakersfield area. The alma pollination is the biggest pollination event in the U.S. bee industry. It takes almost the entire national bee supply. And so 
A semi truck will hold somewhere around 400 to 450 hives of bees. And so you start thinking about this, it takes um, somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 2 million hives of bees in California, say, you know, a couple hundred thousand of them are already there, maybe 250,000 of them are already there. So that means the rest of those beehives have to come from someplace else. So there's a lot of truckloads of bees crisscrossing the United States. Our honeybees get picked up and moved almost 22 times a year. And a lot of people think that this is one of the reasons why our bees are not surviving like they used to. But we've been pollinating fruits and vegetables and nuts since the 70s, 60s, 50s. And we haven't had these kind of losses. And that's from the movie The Pollinators that we'll be discussing today with our guest, Peter Nelson. Well, that little clip was a good summary of a lot of this movie that we that uh, people are going to get to see, Jeff. Uh, I like the reference to Cowboys. I think that's from um, following the bloom back about 15 years oh, ago. Yeah. Uh, Brett Aidey and then Dave Hackenberg talks about the numbers, and then Davey talks about how, much, how often they're moved. And the only thing we didn't get a little bit of in that clip was comments on the diversity of what we need agriculture to go back to. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of that in the movie, John Lundgren and and and, and uh, some of the rest. So, uh I tell you what, why don't we go ahead and get a, get a hold of uh, Peter and uh, take it the next step? I think that's a great idea. This is a fun movie, and uh, look forward to talking to Peter. Hey, has winter's chill and weather forced you inside? Well, did you know that Better Bee offers winter classes you can take from the comfort of your own home? Our classes are taught by Dr. David Peck, and Eastern Apicultural Society Master Beekeeper Ann Fry. Our classes range from basic courses on essentials of beekeeping all the way up to specifics on planning for the seasons ahead and for your success. Visit betterbee.com forward slash classes to view all of our upcoming learning opportunities. Welcome, Peter, to the Beekeeping Today podcast. Uh, Kim and I have been looking forward to li- talking to you for uh, a couple weeks now, ever since we heard about your film, The Pollinators. Well, thanks very much for having me. I'm really, really delighted to be able to talk to you all about it. It's good to meet you in person, Peter. I've watched your film, uh, I think, three times I made it through, and I could not put it. I watched it on my cell phone. I couldn't put it down. And oh, that's awesome. uh, an easy way to, An easy way to watch a movie, certainly, but it was... Knowing a lot of the people that you worked with, it was fascinating to see them in the in the situations that you were at and to hear them talk about what they do for a living. Well, yeah, thanks very much. That's, that's really nice. And I, I knew there'd be a lot of people that you would know on here in particular. Well, but before we get going, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the the project and, and why you were interested in doing this film, The Pollinators, and uh, what actually got you started down this road? Okay, well, I'm a, I've been a beekeeper for about 30 years, uh, sort of a backyard beekeeper. And um, so I have a, a great interest in, in honeybees, of course. And um, I also have a, a great interest in uh, food and agriculture and, and sort of combined all those things um, into making a film. My, my day job, if you will, is I'm a, a, a cameraman or a director of photography is the fancy way to put it. And um, I wanted to kind of uh, put all these kind of interests together in a film. And I didn't really feel like there's some great films about honeybees out there. And I really felt like the story that wasn't told was uh, about these commercial beekeepers and their importance to our food system and our agriculture system. And so I wanted to kind of connect those dots a little bit. Um, And um, I thought doing a, a film about it might be the best way for me to do that. Oh, cool. Well, it's a really good job, and, and I really enjoyed watching the show. Well, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Yeah. I like the way that uh, that uh, you tied the beekeeping industry uh, and agriculture, Agriculture, of course, the two sides of agriculture. You, you worked with the pesticide side, and you worked with the soil health side. And I'm, my background is uh, before bees was farming, so I, I really... Uh, i am been aware of that tie. Lots of people haven't been. It was good to hear you bring in the people that you did, Jonathan Lundgren and the rest, talk, to talk about what's doing. I know his work uh, has been has been 
is getting, I should say, uh, more attention as it should be. And and I'm glad that you picked up on that. What did you learn from him other than what we saw in the film? Well, he's he's a really uh, interesting and passionate guy, as you know. And um, just uh, I wish I could have spent more time with him just because he um, I, I just the great thing about this project was as I was working on it and making this film, I was learning the whole time which is one of the great things about working on documentary films. Um, but, but John was, uh, was really generous with his time, and he's able to kind of, um, I think, connect the dots between um, agriculture and bees and pesticides and varroa in, in kind of a great way. Um, and I think that, you know, what I, what I liked about what he said was his sort of enthusiasm and encouragement for alternative paths. There's not one way to do it. Um, I'm not trying to, to lecture anybody about how farming should be done. I'm not a farmer, but uh, I think there are some people out there that are really trying to experiment and do things differently, which are really not new techniques, um, but they're they're doing things differently to try and take agriculture in a different direction and approach it because it's not really working the way it is now with the, the vast monocultures that we have and the simplification of agriculture. I mean, you can see why agriculture got simplified because it's easier to plant it's easier to harvest if you grow one thing and uh but the downside of that is that it's not really good for the soil and for the environment and there's a lot of uh, a lot of costs in many aspects that come along with that you certainly have that right and the, the other thing that these monocultures actually force beekeepers to do is the, you've seen the vast holding yards uh before almonds uh Hundreds and hundreds, sometimes thousands of colonies sitting in sitting in one field and just disappearing into the mist. Uh, I, I know beekeepers don't like having to do that because when you've got thousands of colonies, you've got thousands of problems, and they're just spread out evenly over everybody. And it's uh, it's an un I'm not going to say an unnatural, but it's certainly not the best of all possible worlds. So it would be nice if we could divide that up. A lot. Yeah, it's it's one of the things that it was really drew me to this uh, to do this project was the fact that I don't think people know uh, that this happens um, and that people people know that that bees are important to agriculture. I think to some extent, and people know that there are problems with bees and bees are going through uh, some really tough times now. They don't know what the specific problems are, but I found so often that people had no idea that these commercial beekeepers move massive amounts of bees around the country. And I think it's really important to know that these beekeepers are not doing this for their own self-interest. They're doing it because they're responding to the changes in agriculture. And there they're used to be that they would get a, a large percentage of their income from honey production. And now it's almost opposite from what people have told me, that a lot of these commercial beekeepers are getting more from pollination fees it sort of goes back to uh what was it about 15 years ago when Doug Why Not did the following the bloom book i think that was probably the beginning of this surge and and he noticed it then and uh, it's only gotten bigger ever since then and then of course you throw in varroa and all of the other problems that have got that are going on uh it's a tough way to make a living it's it's really hard i uh one of the my takeaways from from doing this project was just how hard these beekeepers work and uh, I've you know have had the opportunity to be around a lot of hardworking people in my time working on all kinds of different films but you know these beekeepers particularly during the uh, pollination season almond season as they're up all night moving bees gets a little bit of sleep and then they get up in the next morning fix the equipment that broke move things do the paperwork and uh, and try and catch up and and uh, you know during the day a little bit and then it starts all over again and it's just, it, it impressed me, you know, how hard people like uh, Dave Hackenberg and Bob Harvey, uh, Brett Eddy, they just work. It just seemed to me like there was uh, no good time to call them, but I could always call them. And, and I've always, always reached them no matter what time of day it was, which is pretty astounding that they can, they can uh, work that hard. Cell phones for a commercial beekeeper is your third appendage. Uh, they pretty much live on them the whole time they're moving because that's their only way to communicate. Um, one of the things that I, I was also wondering about is your background in beekeeping. You said you've been a backyard beekeeper for how many years? Just about 30 years. And I, um, I was, you know, I was that kid that was, you know, could uh, never be kept inside. I always had a, a real curiosity about the natural world. And, and luckily I had some great teachers in my life that uh, sort of uh, inspired that. 
uh, to learn about birds and learn about insects and, and get outside and enjoy the world. And that kind of led me almost right into beekeeping and uh, just something I was always interested in. And so, you know, read a bunch of books about it a way long time ago and, and uh, got myself a hive and started up on it and I've just never looked back. It's endlessly fascinating to me. Um, I'm always, uh, always finding something I knew that I hadn't seen before. And there's, I, I tell people kind of jokingly that I've been keeping bees for about 30 years. And, and some days I feel like I know a little bit less than when I started. Um, and the, the bees can always keep you pretty humble. Uh, you have that exactly right. Well, the, the reason, one of the reasons before I knew that you were a beekeeper, I'd watched your movie the first time and, and, uh, uh, my my wife Kathy and I were watching it together, and I turned to her and I said, "This guy's got to be a beekeeper because he's looking at things the way beekeepers look at things, and it it shows up. It's really it's really obvious that not only do you know what you're doing, but you've got you've got that curiosity and that interest that a beekeeper is going to have in this movie. So it makes it even even more interesting to me. Well, thanks, Hart. It's really spectacular uh, footage that you were able to capture of the bees in flight and uh, the high high motion, high, uh, the high film speed uh, of, of those was really good. Well, thank you. It's, it's, a, it's a high compliments from, from both of you. I, re- I really appreciate that. Um, I, you know, one of the, one of my goals was to uh, try and show bees in a way that most people hadn't seen it before, and uh, so uh, using the the super high speed photography uh, was a way that I did that. Um, I, I did a short film called Dance of the Honeybee several years ago, and it kind of inspired me to uh, to work with this very specialized equipment. Um, and I had uh, some great support from uh, from a camera company in New York who who loved. Uh, Loved the, what I had done with uh, with their equipment uh, called Able Cinetech, um, and their Phantom cameras is what they what their the brand name. Um, and they're um, it, it was interesting. I really wanted to show people. I mean, I think that bees are beautiful. I see them all the time. I'm sure you guys feel the same way. But I really wanted to try and show your average person, you know, that these bees are really incredible, um, interesting insects, and the, the social life of uh, beehives is. It's just fascinating and, and looking into that world uh, in a way that I don't think had been done before was really my goal. And so I spent a lot of time out in my backyard. I, I took a part of a beehive and uh, sort of cannibalized it so I could shoot in certain ways. Um, and I called that uh, Studio B. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was a it was a great opportunity to you know pretty much any time I had uh, had an opportunity I'd go out and, and uh, you know film and, and what was kind of interesting to me is you know working in in this particular world and this goes back to my childhood is that you know if you look down in the in the grass in your yard and the the clover fields I would I would sit down and I could just lay down in my my front yard with a camera which I literally did and and found all kinds of interesting insects um, and was able to to capture um, you know what would be a normal thing of bee flying in, flying out and try and show it in a, in a way that it was almost like a ballet and just show it in a way that, um, try and show it in a way that was really beautiful and extraordinary. Um, and I, and I just had the best time doing it. Just found it endlessly fascinating. It, it really shows in, in the quality of the work that you've, you've prepared okay. just from a technical standpoint. Yeah. Is that a, were you shooting on film stock or is that digital? No, it's all, it's all digital. They're, these, yeah, it's a very very specialized um, um, high speed cameras. Um, they're they're called Phantom cameras, and they're made by uh, Visual Products. And they um, they uh, they they can do. I think I shot up to fifteen hundred or fifteen hundred fifty frames per second was about the um, the fastest I went, and keeping at the very high resolution that I was shooting at in four uh, K digital. So it was a uh, um, really spectacular to get down there with a, with a macro lens and extension tubes and, and really kind of try and capture, uh, the, uh, the beauty and, uh, wonder of the bees. And that's something that's actually interesting that, you know, being a beekeeper, there was something that I, uh, was able to employ in doing this was sort of an understanding of behavior, of bee behavior, what was happening with the hive you know, how bees flew, how they landed, how they moved from flower to flower. And uh, that was something that I think gave me a little bit of an advantage um, in, in capturing the, um, the bees in particular in the slow motion. That was, it was really fun. It's fun to watch. You, oh, you, you also did a lot of work at night, uh, which, oh, yeah. which, which had to be tough, not, not physically tough, but I mean, just to get the light 
upright and and the the from where you had to stand so you didn't get run over and uh, all of those things that uh, that was impressive also and and uh, having been there a couple of times i appreciated how hard it must have been to make that work like i said without getting run over and and being close enough to be able to show what was going on yeah, it was it was a, quite an adventure. Um, you know, the the the, the bees at, at night, particularly almonds, uh, is crazy. You know, and and it was uh, I pretty much had in my mind that it would be, and I threw that plan out as you know within the first <laughs> hour of uh, hour of working. Um, and uh, my the promise that I made to the beekeepers was that um, uh, I'm not going to get in the way. I'm not going to get hurt and I'm not going to interfere with your business. And other than that, um, if they're happy to have me, I'd love to be there. And uh, so I, I really worked hard to try and keep that promise, stay out of the way, uh, but, you know, know what's going on. And it happens fast. I mean, they unload a tractor trailer. Some of these guys that unload the pallets and the whole thing would be done in about 20 minutes. And, uh, and that was, uh, it was pretty impressive. So, and it's, and it was, I found it beautiful because it's at night. There's a lot of smoke. There's no a lot of colored lights, and it sort of looked uh, almost like a, a music video in a way to me. Um, and uh, it's just a ballet of the of the bobcats and the you know the the uh, hummerbees, you know, zipping around was was just it was just so much fun. I really had a great time doing it. Um, one of the other things that was really kind of interesting about about what happened was that the unpredictability of it. And so I was meeting beekeepers sometimes that I didn't know. Um, you know, that somebody would refer me to a beekeeper that was, you know, do some filming and they'd say, okay, you're going to meet this guy at this Google pin here. And, and I was like, okay, I don't know who I'm meeting. It's the middle of the night and it's off in the middle of the, you know, the middle of nowhere in the central Valley. <laughs> and, uh, and then I'd get a call and say, okay, it's not going to be two trucks here. It's going to be four trucks and it's going to be 60 miles away. Okay. And so I would just, you know, I'd run off and do it. And so I just sort of had to be really flexible with, uh, with, with, um, how I approached it, but it was, it was tremendously rewarding. And I had a, it was a, just a great adventure for me. Well, That's I can fun. believe that. Uh, Jeff, you ever been able to get out and, and watch the almonds? No. Hey, maybe we should uh, take the podcast out to the almond orchards. One of these springs. I don't want to give that a try this year. I'm kind of glad I'm not in Northern California. However, uh. <laughs> We'd be a little muddy, I think. It's wet out there this year. Yeah. Peter, if, if you can, uh, uh, you do documentary films primarily, as I understand it, and and I, I, I watch them. I go to theaters and, and wherever to watch them, but how do the mechanics of a documentary, are they different than a, a Hollywood movie, or how do they get distributed? Can you share a little bit of that? Because I really don't understand any of that. Well, you know, the, the, it's a, it's a little bit. There's no one way it happens, and that's the that's a short story. I mean, this uh, this film was done. Um, I originally went out to uh, uh, to to do this, and I was going to sleep in my car in order to capture the almonds because I knew I needed to get something, and I wanted to get the almond uh, pollination um, and use that as a little bit of a. Um, put together a little trailer, if you will, to raise some money. Luckily, I, I was able to raise a little bit of money before I got out there. So I was able to get a hotel room <laughs> every once in a while <laughs> um, and a well-needed shower. But um, uh, but then, you know, so, so most of the work in this film was done. Um, it wasn't done for anybody. It wasn't done for, a, you know, a, a broadcast or anything. It was all done uh, sort of on um, on on my own, if you will. My wife is a, is a producer and she wasn't out in the field with me, but she was keeping me out of trouble. She's a very experienced documentary producer. And, um, and so I basically, there was a lot of sweat equity. I just kept on working to uh, try and capture the different elements that I had in mind, which was to follow a season of pollination with a bunch of different beekeepers and use that journey as a way to try and tell the story of pollinator decline and the dependence upon bees for uh, agriculture and our food system. And so, um, so I, I just kept on working, you know, I, I'm a cameraman and so I, um, I own my own gear. And so if I got a call from somebody and this happened, I'd say, we're going to move our bees out tomorrow and it's going to be in Maine. I would, if I could, I could hop in the car and, and head off to Maine and, and start shooting that night, um, or Massachusetts or, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, and so I, I did a lot of running around very last minute. 
uh, because you're dealing with uh, bees and agriculture and nature, none of which are predictable. Um, so all that came together into uh, uh, a documentary film we, we edited for over a year, uh, shaving and, and shaping the story down from about 200 hours of footage to about an hour and a half. And uh, to try and tell this, it's a very complex story in that 90 minutes. And, uh, and uh, we worked really hard to try and tell a, a, an interesting, coherent, and diverse story with, uh, with all the footage that we had. Um, and so now we're at the place where we're, uh, we're trying to, to find a home for it, find a, a distribution home for it. And uh, so we've, uh, we've been in uh, one festival so far, and we have a couple more scheduled in Sonoma and also Newport Beach. Um, and then we're, uh, we're waiting to find out about a whole bunch of other festivals uh, throughout the year. And the hope is that, that we're going to find a home for the film on a, a, a broadcaster or a streaming uh, uh and I don't know whether that's going to be a Netflix or an Amazon or Hulu or PBS. Um, all of them are, you know, potential uh, places that this could find a home. Well, when you get a schedule on, on these people that uh, certainly keep us in mind so we can uh, get beekeepers out to see it, you know, they can't see it if they don't know where it's going to be. So the more you can yep. share with us, the more we'll share with them. So be, I'm uh, excited to get that information out there. Yeah, thanks. It's it's a uh, we're going to be uh, you know we have a we have a website uh, the pollinators dot net and uh, and so on there will be information about where the um, where the film will be uh, playing in festivals um, and ultimately you know what sort of distribution will end up with the film and you know the the great thing about it is that is that beekeepers are a very active group of people and it's a network that you know virtually in every state almost every county in the country there's a beekeeping organization uh, a beekeeping club if you will and uh, so part of my plan is when I go to a different place to do to reach out to those people and that happened in Missoula um, at the uh, the Big Sky Documentary Film Festival when we were there and so I'm, I'm it's part of my initial uh, to try and get interest in the film and, and get the word out but beyond just the the distribution of the film what I want to do is really um, put the film out for uh, extensive outreach ultimately and that might be going to the you know uh different beekeeping conventions to go to universities go to schools um we people are already interested in doing that and we're trying to because I, I this is a tool that i think that i really want to use ultimately for to um to make people aware of where their food comes from and the importance of bees in that process and i think that's uh, you know as as our culture is two or three generations away from the farm. I think that, um, you know, people have, have lost a little bit of the touch about, you know, where, where their food comes from. And, and I want to, if, if, if people can go into a supermarket and pick up an apple and think for a second about the fact that that was pollinated by an insect, whether it's a honeybee or a bumblebee or some other type of bee, um, that would be a, a great goal for me. Well, it's certainly a yeah, good, good observation. About two generations away from being on a farm. It's about right, uh, which is just long enough to forget most of what we knew. Um, and speaking of farms, you've worked with some farmers on there that are really doing the right thing. And, and I, was, I, I was glad to see it actually being done. Um, you talked to, the, there was a couple of guys that you were talking to there. Yeah, Lucas Criswell and his father, uh, William. Yeah. Uh, the down in Lewisburg, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, he's a young guy. Um, he's, uh, uh, and he's in a lot of ways, he's, uh, his dad and he worked together and his dad, um, they're, they're, they're a very funny, uh, funny, like amusing, uh, couple of guys and they, they play off each other and they have a great time. And Lucas is really a, really an interesting guy. He's very much a leader in this, um, in this field. Um, and he's trying, trying different techniques, um, to, uh, to to make it better for uh, growing, better for the bees, better for the environment, better for the soil, and ultimately it does come down to the soil. But it's interesting that a lot of farmers I found uh, they they're looking at it from a cost perspective too, which is very interesting. That they're uh, they're interested in all of those things about um, safety and health and environment, but it's also about the bottom line. And uh, you know Lucas had had kind of a, a great line that he said i like to write my name on the back of the check and not the front of the check um which is a <laughs> <laughs> good observation yeah yeah, yeah. so <laughs> peter one of the other things that i saw that were that that was scary um getting away from farming but uh not too far away was 
what they're finding in beeswax. Jim and Mary Ann Fraser were talking about that. And certainly they've been leading the charge on, on finding it, but uh, it's scary. Yeah, the, the, the bees, uh, you know, they, they bring things home uh, with them. And, uh, and the wax is, uh, is a sort of repository for a lot of these um, uh, pesticides, fungicides, and um, herbicides. And uh, they, you know, bring it home unintentionally, a lot of it and, it, and it gets stored in the wax. And the wax is kind of a sort of a repository for it, which is a little, is a little alarming. Um, and uh, the bees don't have a lot of choice about that. You know, they, I think they, um, they have a way of uh, sequestering stuff when they know it's there, they seal it. Um, but it's not like they really clean house. <laughs> Well, they can't, and uh, the wax just soaks the stuff up like a sponge. We just uh, did a, a program with uh, Reed Johnson from here in Ohio State where they were spraying a pesticide on the bees when they were during blossom. Uh, I mean, that's that's about as bad as it gets, but the, the, the subtle way that, that uh, the Frasers were talking about, it's there, the bees visit the flowers, they bring it back home, it goes into the wax, and then their babies are burnt brought up uh surrounded by this stuff uh i don't i don't know how to uh, how do you stop that yeah well, I, I think you know part of the answer is is uh using less pesticides less herbicides less fungicides i mean i think that you know one of the things that we're we're you know we're doing and we you know collectively is we're using things that uh instead of using an integrated pest management system uh we're tend to use pesticides that are coated on seeds. And uh, again, it's another great expression Lucas had. It's kind of like taking an aspirin in the morning because you might have a headache. You know, instead of seeing the problem that's there and treating for it, you're, you're treating for a problem that you don't know exists yet. And, uh, and I think that that might not be the best approach for, uh, for it. And um, so, so I think, you know, an overall um, using less pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides would be a great first step. And, and what's important here also is the fact that consumers, it's not just farmers that are doing this, but consumers, uh, you know, you, you go into any hardware store and you're going to find shelves and shelves and shelves of all of these products. And I think that uh, many consumers are quick to use them without thinking about the impact that they will have and whether that's a real problem or not. And like anything in nature, once you start pulling things out, it becomes a unstable unstable system and uh and you're killing beneficial insects as well as um, as well as pests and so you're you might be creating more of a problem you know by doing that one of the things that was brought up in the in the movie that i did was unaware of was the use of seven to thin the blooms and the apple blossoms i've never heard that before wow yeah, yeah that, it's a, it's a tough way to it's a tough it's a tough it's tough on bees or it can be. Yeah, or it, anything. Yeah, <laughs> any insect. Yeah, it, it was it was very interesting to discover that, and and uh, of course, not apple. All apple growers do that, or all uh, fruit growers do that. But I guess there's something about the acidity of the seven that um, will kill the bloom um, on on some trees. And, uh, and so that, that's why they, uh, they want to thin the, thin the blooms out so they don't have too many apples on the trees. So they cut their production, have bigger apples, the ones that do survive. Um, but it's, again, it's a, is it the best thing to use? Uh, first of all, that's a question that I would ask and I don't have the answer to that. Um, but then it's also about communication, you know, uh, the, the, you know, these, uh, growers, uh, you know, Bees have wings and they fly, as Dave Hackenberg says. And so if, you know, one apple orchard is using uh, seven um, and does not know that uh, their neighbor might have bees still in there, then you can have uh, have a real problem. So I think that, you know, communication could be a real, uh, there could be a lot better communication amongst farmers, neighboring farmers about, hey, you know, call up your neighbor, text your neighbor. The technology is there. You say, hey, I have to spray to thin my bees or your, uh, to thin my apples. Are your bees out yet? And uh, just that little bit of communication might save a lot of bees and, and uh, make for better relations uh, amongst farmers and beekeepers. Definitely. That, that was amazing. That was one of the surprising things I heard in that movie. We did a story not, not long ago on uh, pollinating apple trees with drones. And, and uh, that's what they're after. They, they load up a drone with pollen and they hover it over a tree and they blast the pollen down. They fertilize the king blossom. 
and move on and they, they can you know they can do it at night they can but it's the king blossom that they're looking for and that's where the money right. is I, i'm i'm envious you had a chance to talk to bill mckibben uh yeah read his stuff uh, I, I think i've read everything that he's written we've reviewed several of his books in our magazine and that was that was a very pleasant surprise when i saw that yeah he's a he's a great guy he um he narrated my short film and i've had the the great fortune to work with him a, a few times in different films over the years and uh and he was uh, very willing to do it and he he came in as um as you know, he has a, an environmental background, as you say. He's, he's a, a real leader um, in the environmental movement, and he also it, he came in, and I, I wanted to because he has a great perspective on the overall uh, system, which I really wanted somebody to to be able to put forth. And and he he has a very direct way of uh, laying it out. For he's not a beekeeper. He has friends who are beekeepers, but he's not. Um, and he's not a farmer, but he understands how the whole system works. And I think sometimes it was, it was very, it's, it's very helpful to have somebody come in and, and give you kind of a broad perspective from 10,000 feet up as how the, how the whole system works together and, and to, to kind of elucidate what happens when you start picking it apart and simplifying it. Yeah, that's that 10,000 feet view. That's what he has. Um, uh, his work with... Was it? It's three fifty. Is this group, isn't it? Getting yeah, uh, carbon dioxide. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then it's Sam Ramsey. You talked to him. We did a we did a program with him a while back, and uh, his his well, what he thinks is important is really important. Uh, his findings have been well. It's changed. It's changed how we think about Varroa, certainly. Yeah, he's he's a he's amazing, and I I. I tried to get him for about a year uh, to, and he was just too busy. He was finishing up his doctorate at the time that I was doing the movie. Um, and I just kind of luckily got him uh, right at the end. Um, and uh, he was, he was just a dynamic, enthusiastic guy whose work is, as you say, has really changed the whole approach of Varroa uh, to treating Varroa. And uh, so he's, he's a, you know, a, and I think he's a great example of, of uh, having innovative thinking that can kind of, uh, look at it in a different way and uh, approach it from uh, not accept the, the, I mean, his, his groundbreaking work is based on going back and looking at other people's work that was basically misinterpreted. And by doing that, he threw basically threw out all the work that was there um, and started new and it gave everybody a new perspective on that. So I was thrilled that, that he was uh, wanted to be part of it. Um, and uh, I, I wish I could have spent more time with him, but he's a, he's a very busy guy. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we were lucky, I think, Jeff, to get him yeah. to sit still for an hour uh, back then. <laughs> but you know, the parallel, the parallel that you just brought up, Peter, is is kind of interesting. Uh, Sam went back and looked at old stuff and interpreted it a different way, and those farmers in Pennsylvania went back and looked at old stuff and interpreted it a different way and bringing it back. So there's the parallel between these two industries is kind of interesting, I think. I, I think it's true, and and it's uh, you know some of the techniques that these farmers are doing, as I as I mentioned before, are not exactly new techniques. I mean, cover cropping and and uh, crop rotation are old techniques. Our grandparents are doing that. Our great grandparents are doing that. Um, but we've gotten away from it, and and uh, I think that a lot of agriculture has gone into more of a chemically dependent uh, system instead of using plants and rotation and allowing that to work for us. And where we are right now, in my opinion, again, as a non-farmer, is, is that there are a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of innovations in terms of technology that are very advantageous to farming, that you can do a lot more efficiently now. And uh, I think that the combination of some of these old techniques with the new technology whether it's computer-based um, organizational system or equipment, um, is is really kind of a good um, is a good time, and I think it's an opportunity for, uh, particularly for young farmers that are or that are starting out now that that can uh, try and uh, you know make small changes and make a you know make a big difference. Well, I sure ho certainly hope some of them do. Uh, it's it's um, not working the way it is right now. Uh, how did, did you enjoy talking to Susan Kegley? I she's always been an interesting. Uh, I use the word character. I don't mean it. Uh, uh, she's an interesting lady. 
She was awesome. I, I just uh, adored her from uh, from the get go, and she <laughs> she she spoke so clearly and um, so to the point. And I think that you know she had, she made so many good points in the film, um, and you her enthusiasm for uh, for bees and insects is just uh, you know uh, palpable and infectious, so to speak. But she she also you know she brought up a very interesting point that I included in the film that that a lot of the changes. Um, you know, in agriculture, she believes they're going to come from the the ground up, and they're the choices that we as consumers make. That if we uh, we want to make a change in, in how things are grown, it's our choices that in the supermarket that will help drive those choices. And and that's a capitalism system that appeals, uh, a capitalistic view that appeals to so many people across the spectrum. Uh, and I, I just really enjoyed that. I mean, she was she was just so much fun to to be with. I learned so much from her. Yeah, and 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 the point you just said, if there's demand, you're going to have people, and but without the demand, hopefully, uh, what she had to say, what all of these people are saying is, we'll change the demand, uh, so that farmers start looking at things a little bit differently. Yeah, it's it's one of the one of the big goals that I had, you know, in, in terms of making this film was that it's you know a lot of people know that there are problems with bees and a lot of people are realize that there's a, a pollinator decline. Um, and that's, a that's kind of a scary issue for a lot of people. Um, and it, I think it would be really easy to make a, a film that was just very bleak and said, you know, all the bees are dying and, you know, and we're in trouble. Um, but what I really wanted to do from the get go was to try and incorporate people that are making a difference and people that are working towards a difference and offer hope um, and, and, and opportunities for anybody who watches this film, that there's something as an issue that makes this so interesting to me. There's something about this issue that everybody can do something about. And, and I wanted to make it very actionable. And that could be really, really simple things like uh, buying honey from a local beekeeper. They're around just around everywhere uh, and uh, you know, buying your cho- choices in the supermarket, what you plant in your garden. Uh, if you, if you more adventurous, you could get involved in politics and, and try and change policy. But I think there's a whole spectrum of um, actionable things that people can do uh, to make a difference in this because it, it, it has to come from us and it has to come from the people. And I think that's uh, that was one of the most appealing things about working on this project for me was I wanted to, to try and, um, make people aware of this problem, what some of the causes are, and then also give them some sort of hopeful uh, choices that they could make in their own life that they could go out and make a difference. It was fun to have, uh, I can't remember who said it, it might have been uh, Susan who said this, that if you don't even need to, you know, the, it's the green lawns that's a problem. It's So if you want a f- green front lawn, that's fine. But let your backyard be wild. Let let the dandelions come up in the back, and and so you're not. It's not either. It's not black and white. You can say, well, you can find a way to make it work within where where you are. And I thought that was a great message. Yeah, that was that was Marianne Fraser um, that, that said that. And uh, yeah, and she's exactly right. I mean, there, there's something even if you live in a city, New York City or Boston or Durham or wherever, uh, you know, having these little pockets of. Uh, um, uh, nectar and, and pollen through plants, whether they're uh, uh, vegetable plants or whether they're um, flowering plants, uh, you know, create an opportunity for pollinators to survive. If there's nothing for them to live on, they can't survive. And I think that all those little choices um, can make a big difference. And and doing what we do, you know, on a lawn is, uh, you know, having clover in your lawn is like such a simple thing and it makes a big difference. One of the things that uh, I, I do a fair number of interviews with newspapers and things, and one of the things, the questions the reporter almost always leaves is, well, what can I do? And my simple answer is plant a flower, feed a bee. And and Zach Browning, of course, plants a lot of flowers in his bee and butterfly yeah. work. Uh, it's good to see some solutions getting bigger and better, I think. Yeah, I think that, you know, the, this, the CRP, the, the Conservation Reserve Program, has really, uh, a, a lot of that has been sort of, um, I think, converted to corn and uh, soy. Uh, and so a lot of that land that was left, traditionally was left uh, vacant for uh, wildflowers, 
um, and uh, natural growth is has been converted. And so Zach and and um, and the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund uh, have really worked very hard at establishing these. Uh, uh, these mixes and these opportunities for forage um, in, in particularly in the Midwest and the North Dakota and South Dakotas um, was, it's just, it's just great. I mean, they, they're really doing inspiring work and you can working with the USGS um, with those uh, projects about figuring out what the bees are eating, when they're eating it uh, and, and how it's affecting them nutritionally. You know, you can really kind of, again, it's a use of technology that you can really dial in and create a very healthy environment. Uh, for bees, and I, I think that's something that's that's also an important thing is nutrition, which comes along like just like us. If you know, if you, if we all eat Twinkies, uh, you're not going to be healthy. Uh, but if you know, eat a, a, a wide a wide variety of different things uh, is is a healthy way for us to live, and it's the same way for bees. They need a diverse and healthy uh, diet of uh, of pollen um, and nectar sources. Well, I know Brett is uh, Brett eighty is associated with a pollinator stewardship, and that's one of the things that they're aimed at doing is getting getting bee food where there was grass, uh, getting bee food where there was on roadsides and those sorts of things. So there's there's a, a lot of solutions that are that are trending. Is that the right word? I don't think we're there yet. Uh, but you can see them from here, and and if we can keep them going, I hope that this film gets more of this going because now people can actually talk to the, listen to the people who are uh, making it happen and see that it's working. So um, your, your, your actions here, I think are, are a good hive tool for moving things along. Oh, good. Well, thank you. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, the, the wild uh, flowers uh, is kind of an interesting thing. And I, I see it around here where I live in New York that, uh, you know, every once in a while I'll see a truck going down a highway that is spraying an herbicide on the side of the road. And they say, well, you know, people don't think twice about that. But as a beekeeper, I look at that and I say, there goes a lot of habitat. There goes a lot of uh, forage for, for bees, even if it's not my bees, it's somebody else's bees or other pollinators. And I think that those kind of choices, while they're convenient and maybe easy, uh, may not be the best choices. And, uh, you know, leaving some of those those wild, uh, you know, wild habitat and forage areas are, is a really good opportunity. Just letting those be is a really important thing for bees and other pollinators. Right. So how well did you eat when you were talking to Dan Barber? <laughs> uh, uh, <clears throat> Well, it was, when we did that interview, uh, we were actually where we set up at uh, Stone Barns was right next to the bakery, and uh, I have to tell you, uh, we <laughs> ate pretty well. Um, and that that place is is uh, the Stone Barn Center for for Agriculture is is amazing. Uh, it's just a, it's a place that I've been to, and it's a place that I've actually taken classes at. I took a, a class on soil there, uh, probably close to ten years ago. Um, you know, just because I have an interest in gardening. And uh, Dan is also one of those big thinkers um, who is able to connect the dots between literally between the plate and the field. And uh, it was a real honor to be able to to sit and talk with him about those those things. And the farm itself, uh, the, the agriculture center, Jack Algier and his whole team is really very inspiring because they, uh, they they're really walking the walk about how to uh, make these. Uh, make these changes and, and work with the system in a very productive way. And what they're getting out of it is, is very good food f for the restaurant, but they're also a big part of their mission is to teach other people about those choices. And uh, one, one quick story that I had experience I had there a couple of years ago, uh, my wife and I went down there to visit during the day and just they have a little cafe there and they have a demonstration garden. And, uh, and I, and I, was in there I was looking at the flowers and I was of course I was watching the bees and what was going around and I heard heard a woman behind me say is this corn or is this wheat and I turned around and I thought she was joking and I turned around she was standing there pointing at the most iconic ear of corn on a plant that I had ever seen and and I thought she was joking and I almost laughed and then I thought you know that's pretty incredible that a she was comfortable to ask that question and B that she was in a place where somebody could answer that question respectfully and make it a teachable moment. And I thought that pretty much embodies what that place is all about. You shouldn't assume that everybody understands how agriculture works. But it's so important to have a place where people can go learn, uh, you know, how food is grown, the importance of good soil and, and, and where their food comes from. 
Well, it looked like it, it, looked, it looked like you were having fun when you were there, and uh, it sounds like it was, it, I, I didn't even take away that much when you were there. So, I'm uh, thanks for the details. It sounds like a, I may have to I may have to drive out there. It's 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 worth a trip. I, I've been lucky enough to eat in the restaurant, and uh, it's a it's unlike any other place. Um, you know, m- most people would ever eat. I mean, a, a Dan Barber is one of the you know he's in the top 10 chefs in the world and really innovative, uh, uh, ways of looking at food and our food system. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that was really interesting. And that's for sure. So at the end of it all, and you're looking back at uh, the film and, and, and the finished product, was there anything that you discovered, anything that you learned that make you reconsider how you're keeping your own bees at home? Anything you change as a beekeeper? Hmm. Interesting. Um, you going to get a forklift? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sort of, my, my beekeeping me- keeping methods are, uh, are pretty traditional. Um, you know, I, I, I work off of uh, Langstroth hives and, and I just have just a few hives. Um, I like wax foundation. I like the smell of it. For me, it's a very tactile uh, sensory experience. Um, and, uh, I, I guess, you know, one of the things that it, I had really come through was what I do maybe affects my neighbor. And, uh, you know, that's, that's an, in, in this, na- in this time of, uh, Varroa and the spread of Varroa, uh, that's kind of an important thing. It's almost like uh, it reminds me a little bit of the vaccination, uh, debate, you know, that, uh, my bees, if they have, uh, Varroa and they're a weak colony, then I could be really hurting somebody else's bees, uh, by doing that. So, so that's one thing that I thought was, uh, that I'm a little bit more on top of. I had a couple of years when I did more of a kind of a homeopathic uh, method of, 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 of Varroa treatment, uh, because I didn't want to deal with a lot of chemicals, but I found a, you know, somewhere in between. And I, I personally have, you know, started to use hop garden. I think that's pretty good. That's been working for me where I am. Um, but I, I think that, you know, the, the great thing about beekeeping for me is that it really makes me slow down and pay close attention to what's going on in the world around me, uh, to wherever I am, uh, to look at what's, what's in bloom, what people are eating, what flowers the bees are on. And just, uh, I, I like that connection to nature that beekeeping, uh, gives me. And I never get tired of just, uh, having some time out you know, in a beehive and just uh, enjoying it. Cause I always see something different and uh, it's, I always learn something. Yeah. I think that's, I think any beekeeper would agree with you on that statement. I was, at, well, I was I, at a meeting, uh, one quick story, yeah. Jeff. I was at a meeting this weekend and, and I was on a panel and a, a Q and a panel. And one of the people in the audience said, uh, we know you get around a lot. He says, what one thing, What's the one thing that that you've noticed that almost every beekeeper, all beekeepers, have in common? And and I think I think what you just said was a lot of it is beekeepers like getting together a because they're always going to learn something from another beekeeper, but b they're with a whole bunch of people that don't think they're crazy. And <laughs> and and you know you put your hands in a box of live stinging venomous insects. And and a lot of people are going to take a couple steps back, but when you're with other beekeepers, you don't have to you don't have to be that defensive, and you have that ability and time and opportunity to notice those kinds of things. It's it's true, and you know I, one of the things that I really wanted to show is just you know a lot of people have had um, have a fear of bees as a stinging venomous insect, um, and more often than not, it's probably caused by a you know incident with yellow jackets when they were a kid, but. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, it's important for people to understand that bees don't want to, don't want to sting you because they die in the process and they only do it when they're threatened and, and, uh, and feel like they're in danger. And, uh, I, I really wanted to show people, you know, sort of the charismatic aspect of bees and how wonderful they are. And I, I think that one of the people that I included in the film that sort of exemplifies that is Lee Catherine Bonner down in Durham, North Carolina, young, inspiring um, woman who's, uh, you know, runs a company called uh, Bee Downtown. And, um, and she was great. She was out there in just shorts and a t-shirt. And I thought, I would never do that. But, (laughs) you know, she's, she was out there and she wasn't getting stung. And she just approaches it in a very gentle, caring way. And and, uh, I think her whole approach literally literally and figuratively is, is, uh, you know, is that these 
we need to really pay attention to these these important pollinators around us. That's really good. Well, Peter, we really appreciate you taking your time this afternoon to join us on Beekeeping Today podcast. It's really been a pleasure having you on the show. And also, it's been great watching the movie, and I look forward to seeing it uh, get out and about in the public in the coming months. Well, th- thanks very much for having me. I, I really appreciate it, and I and I will keep, um, um, if I can uh, plug the website a little bit, the Please. pollinators.net. The pollinators.net is where you know information will be um, uh, will be about the film as it comes forward, and I'll be sure to keep you all in touch uh, because what you guys are doing is uh, is a great thing and spreading the word and and educating people about bees, and that's I think that's all of our goal. Oh yeah, definitely, and thanks for that. Yeah, I'll make sure that all the websites that you've mentioned and we've mentioned on today's uh, show are in the show notes so that uh, listeners can go out and uh, research as they wish. There's one other thing I wanted to um, wanted to say about um, just the beekeepers uh, themselves. And, and one thing that I took away from, uh, you know, working with people like Dave Hackenberg, Davey Hackenberg, Brett Aidey, uh, Glenn Card, and just a, an incredible group of, and Zach Brown, an incredible group of people that are so dedicated um, to their bees and really care about them. You know, I, I think that they, they, some people might think that these, um, you know, they move these bees around with pallets and forklifts and tractor trailer loads around the country, but these beekeepers really, really, really care about their bees. And, you know, when you have a, a, a bee kill, like, uh, I had the misfortune of being able to film that a couple of times, um, uh, it, it made me sick to my stomach and, and it really hurt them. And I could tell, uh, how much uh, their bees really mean to them. They're they're not pets, uh, but they do care about them. And and I think that's something that I really took away, how hard these guys work and uh, to, to do agriculture and, and pollination and uh, how much they care about what they do. The movie is really well done, and, and that respect you have for the beekeepers uh, really comes through in the, in the movie. So it's, it's, it's fun to watch. Yeah, well, thank really you. good. Well, we'll play out on one last clip from the movie The Pollinators that is produced and, and directed by Peter Nelson, our guest today on the podcast. This clip is of Marianne Frazier talking about what we can do as beekeepers and as neighbors and how we can uh, take care of each other and all of the pollinators uh, on the planet with our choices that we make every time we go to the store. So thanks a lot, Peter. P- uh, Kim, thanks a lot. Yeah, uh, Jeff. Peter, thank you. This was, uh, it was, like I said, it was good. It's good to meet you uh, finally. But uh, I thoroughly enjoyed the film. Well, thanks so much for having me. I, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to to share this film, and I look forward to sharing it with the uh, with as many people as I can. Well, we'll see what we can do to help. Thank you. Thank you. We ourselves have become users, consumers of pesticides. You can see that very easily when you go to Walmart, you go to Lowe's, you go to Home Depot, and the shelves are lined with, with pesticides and particularly herbicides. So, you know, you think, well, herbicides aren't toxic, but herbicides are completely, in many places, eliminating the forage that bees require. Bees require flowers. They require nectar and pollen-producing flowers. And this widespread use of herbicide, not only in agriculture, but also by homeowners, Everybody wants a magnificent green lawn without a single dandelion or clover plant in that lawn or a blooming flower in that lawn. That's a food desert for bees. If you want a green lawn, great. You know, let your front yard be green and make, let, allow the backyard to have some dandelions and clover and grow a pollinator garden. Herbicides, fungicides, and insecticides, all three of those categories are problematic for our, our bees. And again, it's not just honeybees, it's, it's uh, all of our bee species. Well, that was a great discussion with uh, Peter about his movie, The Pollinators. I really enjoyed that movie, and I really, really enjoyed the discussion. You know, I think, Jeff, uh, that last little bit there you just had with Marianne Fraser, uh, you couldn't get better advice. Grow, you know, feed a bee, plant a flower, and let's see if we can keep away from the pesticides. Yeah. Uh, I got to tell you, I think our industry is really fortunate to have uh, somebody like Peter make a film like this because he's also a beekeeper and has been one for, what did he say, 28 years, something like that. So he has the insight of of knowing what's important uh, already. And he has the experience to be able to show what 
uh, he thinks is important and what beekeepers think are, is important and to be able to show what uh, people who aren't beekeepers need to be able to see and to know when they watch this film. Um, I think in the same amount of time, somebody with different or less experience would not have been as, as successful. So, as I said, I think we were, we're just darn lucky to have a beekeeper be a movie maker. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts, wherever you download and stream the show. Your vote helps other beekeepers find us quicker. Even better, write a review and let other beekeepers looking for a new podcast know what you like. You can get there directly from our website by clicking on reviews along the top of any web page. As always, we thank Bee Culture, the magazine for American beekeeping, for their continued support of Beekeeping Today podcast. We want to thank our regular episode sponsor, Global Patties. Check them out at globalpatties.com. Thanks to Strong Microbials for their support of this podcast. Check out their probiotic line at strongmicrobials.com. We want to thank Better Bee for their longtime support. Check out all their great beekeeping supplies at betterbee.com. Thanks to Northern Bee Books for their support of Bee Books Old and New with Kim Flottam. Check out all of their books at northernbeebooks.co.uk. And finally, and most importantly, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on the show. Feel free to leave us comments and questions at leave a comment section under each episode on the website. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks a lot, everybody.